All right, so <clears throat> we said in the very first uh, definitions in this unit that electrochemistry involves um, using a spontaneous redox reaction to make electricity, to generate electricity. To, to understand how that can happen, let, let's consider a very, very simple and very common redox reaction. Okay, so you don't need to sketch pictures here, but uh, you might want to jot down enough to, to understand what's going on. If you take a piece of um, zinc metal, if you look on the picture on the left here, um, zinc metal is a silvery colored metal. And you take a test tube with copper two sulfate solution. Copper two sulfate solution would be a blue colored solution. And you put that zinc metal into the copper sulfate solution, okay? And then observe what happens. You guys actually, you probably don't remember this, but back in grade nine science, you did this, this very experiment. So when you put the zinc into the copper sulfate, almost immediately the surface of the zinc starts turning what appears to be black. But if you give it enough time, um, it's, no, it's not black. It actually gets a reddish brown precipitate all over the surface. In the pictures, you can see that the surface of the zinc is getting darker and thicker. And by the time the third picture is there, you've got this big uh, jaggedy looking precipitate all over the zinc metal. Do you notice something else happening in those three test tubes though? The blue oh. color is disappearing. Yeah, the blue color is fading. And, and what was causing the blue color? What did I say was causing the blue color? Anybody? Copper sulfate. Yeah, and more specifically, the copper. So the aqueous copper, the copper 2 plus ion, was responsible for the blue color. If you have copper sulfate, copper nitrate, copper chloride, if it's copper two plus, it's gonna be a blue colored solution. So it's not the sulfate that matters. Um, if you think about it from the particulate level, from the atomic level, right? And you think about collision theory back to our kinetics unit, maybe even a little bit of liquids and solids from grade 11 chemistry. The zinc metal, the strip of zinc, while it's solid and it's a metal, you might remember from grade 11 that metals have some kind of crystal lattice structure. So if you look in this circle here, this enlarged circle, all these gray spheres, those are all in a crystal lattice structure. That's the zinc metal strip. Those zinc atoms are fixed in place, right? They're stuck in the solid metal, so they can't move. Um, but over here next to them, you can see a whole bunch of water molecules, these little red things with two white hydrogens. Those are water molecules, and by far, that's the thing that's greatest amount. But if you look really close, there's a few little brownish orange spheres. Those are the copper ions, and they're aqueous. Technically, they're hydrated. They're surrounded by the water molecules, but they're mobile. They can move around. And then there's these sulfate ions. The sulfate are the larger ions with a sulfur surrounded by oxygens. They're also mobile. They can move around. So if you imagine what's happening from a collision theory perspective, the zinc atoms can't move. The copper ions are moving around in the water. And every once in a while, a copper cation collides with the surface of the zinc collision theory. Copper ions collide with the zinc surface. Now what happens when they collide? When the copper 2 plus hits the zinc metal surface, a redox reaction happens. The zinc atom gives up two of its electrons and the copper ion gains those two electrons. So at the surface of the zinc metal, zinc ions with atoms that have lost their electrons, they're floating away into the water. Once it's lost its electron and now it's a cation, the zinc cation floats away into the water. And where there used to be a zinc cation, now, sorry, a zinc atom, now there's a copper atom because a copper two plus ion 
picked up the electrons and precipitated on the surface of the zinc. So zinc is being oxidized in this example. The zinc is losing its electrons. And the copper cations, the copper two plus, is being reduced. It's gaining electrons. And this reaction is clearly spontaneous. Not spontaneous here does not mean quick. It doesn't mean like all of a sudden or anything. Spontaneous meant, do you remember from our first slide in the notes? Spontaneous means what? Has a huge equilibrium constant. How can I tell from the pictures that this reaction has a huge equilibrium constant? Nobody? Um, Isn't it because there's like no copper left it, in the- it, Exactly. Yeah, it reacts very completely. Yeah, the blue color doesn't just get a little bit lighter, it fades completely. So there's, there's no copper left essentially in the water. Of course, from an equilibrium perspective, there would have to be some copper, but it's so little that it looks like clear water at the end. So the copper concentration goes to almost zero. So since the copper is getting essentially completely used up, this reaction must have a huge equilibrium constant. Okay, so the copper cations are pretty much completely precipitating as copper metal on the surface of the zinc. The net ionic equation for this, you might want to jot down. Zinc solid reacts with copper two plus and becomes zinc two plus and copper. So every beginning chemistry student has done this or seen this. They know if you put a piece of zinc metal into a solution of copper two plus, this spontaneous reaction happens. And if you think about it, you realize this is a redox reaction. Zinc is giving electrons to the copper ion, which is gaining them. What about the reverse reaction? What if I took a piece of copper metal and put it into a zinc solution? Would I see a reaction there? little equilibrium review here, people. If I put a copper metal strip into a zinc solution, would I see a reaction happen? No. Why not, Trevor? Because the KC is so small. That's right. The forward reaction we just agreed had to have a huge equilibrium constant because you can see in the picture the blue color completely disappeared. If the forward reaction has a huge equilibrium constant, then the reverse reaction would have an infinitely small equilibrium constant, which basically means it doesn't really make much product at all. So putting copper into a zinc solution, you wouldn't see anything happen. Putting zinc into a copper solution, yes, it, you, could, you would see it. And it's also kinetically very fast. Those two things are separate, right? having a large equilibrium constant does not necessarily mean it will be a fast reaction, but this reaction is very fast. It has a low activation energy as well, okay? So <clears throat> if electrons are easily transferred from zinc to copper, do you think we could use that? Do you think we could use it to generate electricity? Because electricity is a movement of charge, isn't it? It's often thought of as a movement of electrons. When you plug something in, electrons are flowing through a wire. Well, we know zinc wants to give its electrons to copper. So couldn't we somehow use those electrons that are being moved from zinc to copper? Couldn't we use those electrons to, to light a light bulb or something? That's the idea here, okay? Now you decide if you want to write anything down here. This may or may not add to what we've just said. You may find it's kind of repetitive. Um, why does the precipitate happen on the surface of the zinc? Why, why doesn't the precipitate happen just in the middle of the solution? Why is the precipitate of copper on the surface of the zinc metal? Well, because it's like the zinc is attached to the strip. So 
it would be stuck there. Yeah, the zinc atoms were in the solid state and, and they, they can't leave, right? Um, so the only way the reaction could happen is if the copper ions, which are in the solution, if they collide with the surface of the zinc. So, so the reaction has to happen on the surface of the zinc metal, right? Yeah. All right. So if we're going to <coughs> use this spontaneous reaction, we have to answer a, a simple, we have a, basically an engineering problem, right? We, it's not really a chemistry problem. We know zinc wants to give electrons to copper, but how do we make use of that is the question. We know that zinc wants to get oxidized, so zinc will become zinc 2 plus and lose two electrons. We know copper 2 plus wants to gain those electrons and make copper, wants to be reduced. But we, we know if we put the zinc metal directly into the copper solution, well, that's useless to us because the reaction is going to happen right there. It's going to happen at the surface of the zinc metal we will not be able to use those electrons. So it turns out what we have to do is separate. That's the key idea. We have to separate the copper ions from the zinc atoms in the metal strip. We cannot let the copper ions collide with the zinc atoms in the zinc strip. If they collide, the electrons are gonna be given if I can use a football analogy, the electrons will be given in a handoff. Zinc will hand off its electrons to copper. And if they're handed off to copper, we cannot use them. But if we separate them, if we don't let the copper ions collide with the zinc, but instead we provide a path that zinc can send its electrons to copper, to use again a football analogy, if we force the zinc atoms to pass their electrons to copper, then as they're being passed to copper, as they're flying through, the, through a wire or something like that, then we can put something in their path. We can put a light bulb or something in their path and make them go through our light bulb and do some work for us. So that's the key idea. We have to separate the zinc from the copper but provide a path that the electrons can get from zinc to the copper. So we have to provide an external path. That external path is going to be a wire. Huh. So when a battery runs out, it means oh, that oh, you're getting you're getting you're getting ahead of us here. Okay, hold okay. on to that. Hold on to that, Don. We'll talk about what happens when a battery runs out. But let's first talk about what happens in a battery. All right, so here's a picture of an electrochemical cell. And more specifically, you might want to give it a more specific name. Electrochemical cell is a very broad term. A more specific term, this is called a galvanic cell. Galvanic. G-A-L-V-A-N-I-C. Anybody from biology class know the name Galvani? Nobody? Galvani was a famous Italian who uh, discovered that your nervous system is based on electricity, based on electrical signals. He did a rather morbid experiment where he chopped off the legs of frogs and hung them from a wire and then zapped the legs with electricity and watched them twitch. So he realized that the muscle contractions in the frog legs were, were uh, induced by electrical signals. All right, another fellow, this is also referred to as a voltaic cell. So it's so a, a galvanic cell, a voltaic cell, V-O-L-T-A-I-C, voltaic named after another Italian chemist, this time a guy named Volta. Volta built the first battery. He took pieces of zinc and copper and he alternated them. So he put a piece of zinc down. Then he took a piece of wet uh, cloth that he had soaked in salt water. He put that wet cloth with salt water on top of the zinc. Then he put a layer of copper on top. 
Then he put another cloth with salt water in it, and he, then he put another zinc strip, and then another cloth of, of salt water, and then another copper strip. And he just kept doing that until he had a huge pile. In fact, it was called an electric pile of zinc and copper strips. And at the bottom might be zinc, at the top would be copper. He brought this thing to parties and, and uh, aristocrats paid him to do this. At their parties, after they'd been drinking, they would, they would then, he would then attach wire or something to the bottom zinc and the top copper. And he would bring these drunken aristocrats up and he would zap them and they would get little zaps of electricity. And they, would, they, they thought this was the most amazing thing in the world, a party trick. It's like taking a nine volt battery and touching your tongue to the two parts. And going, ah, look, I've been electrocuted. Okay, it was a big party favor. I hope as I'm talking, you're sketching, by the way. <laughs> so, voltaic cell and a galvanic cell. So, on the left in this picture is a beaker containing a zinc solution, zinc two plus. Now it just says zinc two plus, but you guys understand there has to be an anion. So that this could be zinc sulfate or it could be zinc nitrate or something like that. So, but we're only interested in the zinc two plus. In your picture, could you label it as one molar, one molar zinc two plus? It doesn't have to be one molar, but by using one molar, we're going to create what's called a standard electrochemical cell, a standard voltaic cell. In the other beaker, there's a copper solution. So this time it's a one molar copper two plus solution, maybe a one molar copper sulfate solution. So the left hand beaker would be full of colorless zinc solution. The right hand beaker is full of blue copper solution. Put a piece of copper metal into the copper solution. Put a piece of zinc metal into the zinc solution. So a zinc strip and a copper strip. Okay, just a piece of copper metal, a piece of zinc metal. Now, if you look closely at this picture, what appears to be happening to the zinc metal? It's getting smaller. And or there's less of it. And what's happening to the copper metal? <laughs> it's getting bigger. And if you look back, let me go back here for a minute. Do you remember in this reaction what was happening? The zinc was dissolving, wasn't it? The zinc was leaving and becoming zinc 2 plus. The copper was precipitating as copper metal. So over here in our voltaic cell, at the copper strip, copper ions are precipitating, which is why it's getting bigger. The zinc strip appears to be dissolving, right? The zinc atoms are leaving and becoming zinc two plus. So what will happen to the zinc's concentration if it started at one molar? Anybody? It, will the concentration increase? If the zinc strip is dissolving, it's producing more zinc ions, isn't it? So the zinc concentration will go up and the copper concentration will go down because it's precipitating. Now, connect the two strips with a wire. Okay, just connect them with a wire. In this picture, they threw a light bulb in there. You could have put a voltmeter if you want to measure the voltage. You could even just put a wire, which would be kind of dumb. The battery would run down and you wouldn't be getting anything from it. Okay. And you'll notice in the picture, electrons are flowing from zinc through the wire towards copper. Why are they flowing in that direction? How do I know they flow in that direction? Somebody from our earlier discussion, how do we know electrons must be flowing from the zinc towards the copper? There is. Thank you. I mean, from our earlier discussion, how do we know that the air arrows should go in that direction? Is that reaction at a large KC? Uh, I think I'd like because, a better answer. Um, the, 
the Sega. zinc is losing electrons and the copper is gaining electrons? That's right. If you go back to our earlier slide, zinc was being oxidized, wasn't it? Which meant zinc was losing electrons. Copper was being reduced. So copper is gaining electrons. If the zinc is losing electrons, if it's being oxidized, electrons are leaving from zinc. Is this making sense? Because I want you to understand so you can predict this, right? Copper's, yep. copper's being reduced. So to be reduced means you're gaining electrons. That means electrons have to flow in there, okay? Now those two metal strips are, are generically referred to as electrodes. Both the two strips, the metal, the zinc and the copper are electrodes. The one where oxidation occurs, the zinc strip, is the anode. <clears throat> okay, the anode is where oxidation occurs. The cathode is where reduction occurs. Now, one way to memorize that would be to look at the first letter in both of those things. Anode starts with a vowel. Oxidation starts with a vowel. Cathode starts with a consonant. And reduction starts with a consonant. That's one way to remember it. They're called so, anode and cathode because anion and I'm going anion. To, I'm going to explain why they're called anode and cathode in just a sec. Some people remember the phrase red cat, a red cat, reduction at the cathode. Okay. So why are they called anode and cathode? Well, look inside the zinc beaker here. What's happening? Uh, negative electrons are leaving, right? As negative electrons leave, what would happen to the charge inside that beaker? They'd become positive. So I want you to label your diagram, put a bunch of little positive symbols on the zinc strip inside the beaker. Put a little plus, 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 plus. If electrons are leaving, it must become positively charged. What's happening on the copper strip? If electrons are coming in there, it's going to become negatively charged. So on the copper strip in your diagram, put a bunch of little negative symbols, negative, 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 negative. So because zinc is being oxidized, it loses electrons and that beaker is becoming positive. And because copper is gaining those electrons, it's being reduced. This beaker is becoming negative. Well, that buildup of charge would be a big problem. If we allow the charge to build up, if this, char if this beaker becomes positively charged, will electrons which are negative, will they continue to leave if the beaker is positively charged? Talk to me. Mm, no. Will uh, that point, negative electrons difficult. spontaneously leave a positively charged beaker? No, they won't, right? Because of electrostatic attraction, the negative electrons will not want to continue leaving from a positively charged beaker. Looking at it the other way around, will the negative electrons continue to flow into a negatively charged beaker? Do negatives go into a negatively charged beaker? No, they don't. No. So the, the buildup of charge, the negative, the positive and the negative buildup of charge would stop the flow of electricity and it would happen instantly. The, the battery just wouldn't work. So how do we fix that? How do we prevent the buildup of the charge? What's this in the middle? A salt bridge. Oh, I get it. What the hell is a salt bridge? Well, in that, in that description I gave earlier of Volta's pile, what did he put in between the layers of copper and zinc? You remember my story? Salt, and salt water. Yeah, he put strips of cloth that were soaked in salt water. Salts contain ions. 
as long as it's a soluble salt, the ions can move if they're in water, right? So you could just take a piece of cloth that's been soaked in salt water or a piece of filter paper soaked in salt water. Or if we get to do this at school next week, we'll use it, what's called a U-shaped glass tube, which is what this looks like right here, filled with salt solution. So we'll take a U-shaped glass tube filled with salt solution, and we'll call it a salt bridge to connect the two half cells. So this entire thing is a cell. The two beakers are half cells. Now, what does that salt bridge do? Well, look at the arrows. If this beaker is becoming positively charged when the electrons leave, what will it do in the salt bridge? What will the positively charged beaker do to the salt bridge? It will pull out the anion? It's going to pull out the anions, attract the anions. Hey, wait a minute. Anions are being attracted towards the zinc? then what should we call the zinc strip? An anode. You get that? What happens over here at the copper strip? It was becoming negatively charged because those electrons were coming in. So what does the negatively charged copper attract? It attracts the cations from the salt bridge. So the cations go towards what? the copper. That means copper is the cathode. So it's called a cathode because it attracts the cations. The zinc is called the anode because it attracts the anions. Okay, so what's the function of the salt bridge? Well, it depends on the level of, of detail you want to go into from a grade nine science perspective. You could say the salt bridge is completing the circuit. Without that salt bridge, you wouldn't have a complete circuit, a complete path for the electron, for the charge to flow. A better answer as to what the purpose of a salt bridge is, the better answer is not written here on the slide, so you might want to add it. The salt bridge prevents the buildup of charge inside the battery, inside the cell. The salt bridge keeps the two half cells electrically neutral. Okay, not, not neutral like pH neutral, but neutral as in electrically neutral. Now, I, I've used the word battery and I've used the word cell. Technically, they're not the same things. When you pick up what you call a battery, what, what's its brand name called often? What's a common brand name of a battery? Energizer. Yeah, OK, Energizer. another one, another one. Duracell. Duracell. Duracell, Dura yes. When you pick up, if you're just holding one of those things in your hand, you're not holding a battery. Okay? If you're holding one of those things in your hand, that's not a battery. Okay? I wish I was at school right now because Every time I teach this, I do the same thing at school. I pick a kid in the front row of the, of the desks and I, I go up to them and I slap them in the head. It's kind of funny. And I go, you know, what, what did I just do? What did I just do to that kid if I slapped them in the head? I committed an assault. You got that? An assault. I hit him in the head. Then I hit them in the head a bunch of times in a row. Bang, 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 bang. What did I just do now? Come on. If the first one was an the assault, salt. the first one oh, was an assault. The battery. Second one was a battery. Have you heard of the phrase, you've been charged with assault and battery? You heard that phrase before? An assault, <laughs> yeah. an assault is like a singular thing. Assault, he punched me. That's an assault. If he punched me repeatedly, that's a battery, right? To batter is to repeatedly punch. Um, here's another example, like a military example. A, a single cannon on a hill is just that, it's a cannon. But if you have two or three or four cannons together on a hill, 
that is a battery. All right, so you see where I'm headed here? What do you put inside your calculator to make it work or inside your whatever electrical device? You don't, you don't usually just put one of those things in, you put two or you put four. A singular one is a cell. But when you put two of them in your phone or in your calculator, or you put four of them in the calculator, then together they are a battery. All right. So technically, what we see here in the picture is not a battery. This is a cell. And specifically, it's a wet cell because the beakers are full of liquids. Wet cells are unusual. The batter, the things we normally call batteries, they're not full of liquid. They're full of a moist paste. So they're referred to as dry cells, even though they're not dry. They're, they're, they do have some liquid in them, but it's a paste. It's not uh, sloshing around. Does anybody know of a, of a wet cell that we actually do commonly use? Car battery? Exactly. A car battery is full of liquid, right? So that is a, an example of a wet cell. But the most common batteries that we use are, are dry cells, and they're not they're, they're much more complicated and more advanced than what we see here. What we see here is the simplest, the original electrical, electrochemical cells, okay? We'll talk later about the more common ones. Is this one like a uh, lemon battery? Um, it's a similar idea, it's a similar idea. Um, do you wanna watch this or not? Yes. I, I actually, I don't know if you can hear it. So this is actually the same thing that you just sketched, but it's a real life picture, right? So there's the copper strip in the copper solution, the zinc strip in the zinc solution. There's that U-shaped glass tube, the salt bridge, and you're not going to actually see anything interesting here because just a wire connecting them. So this would be like short circuiting your battery, running it down without doing anything. Can you hear that? Could no. you hear that? No. Yeah, I forgot to no. share my sound. So I'm gonna just leave that. All right, let, let's talk about what a voltage is. Okay, what, we, what a, the, the voltage of a battery. Um, I'm gonna use an analogy here, which is a little bit out of favor in, in the world of physics today, um, but, <laughs> but up until recently was quite commonly used. Um, water flows from the top of a waterfall to the bottom of a waterfall spontaneously, right? Now I'm using the word spontaneously here in a slightly different way than I used earlier. The water goes from the top of the hill of the waterfall to the bottom. Why doesn't it go from the bottom to the top? Why doesn't water flow up the waterfall? We all know it doesn't, but why not? Simple answer would be because the water at the top of the waterfall has a higher potential energy than the water at the bottom of the waterfall. And, and things spontaneously move from higher potential energy positions to lower potential energy positions. So if you put a ball at the top of a hill, it will flow to, it will roll down to the bottom. But if you put a ball at the bottom of the hill, it does not roll up to the top on its own, right? So things will spontaneously move from a higher potential energy state to a lower potential energy state. In the example that we just talked about, electrons were moving from zinc to copper and, and they don't go the other way around spontaneously, right? That reverse reaction we said, would have an infinitely small Kc value. So why do the electrons go from zinc to copper, but not the other way around? By this same analogy, it must be that the electrons in zinc have a greater potential energy than the electrons in copper. So when we allow them, the electrons will flow from zinc to copper to go from a higher potential state to a lower potential state. So there's a difference in potential energy between those two electrodes. Now here I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a bit of a slate of hand, or a slate of voice. There is a difference in potential between the two electrodes. Did anybody just catch what I did right there? <laughs> no? 
I, I went from talking about a difference in potential energy to a difference in potential, <laughs> okay? The potential difference is referred to as the cell potential. We give it the symbol capital E subscript cell, E cell, and normally it's a scripted letter E, but with this font, I'm just using an italicized E. And it's measured in units called volts. Right there, you see this cannot be the same thing as a difference in potential energy, right? Because if it were a difference in potential energy, the, the units would not be volts, they'd be joules. Um, a volt is actually a joule per coulomb. Volts are a combination of energy and charge. So it's a little bit more complicated than what I've just described, but not much. So the cell potential measured in volts is sometimes referred to as a cell voltage. It also has an older name, which as I said earlier, is out of fashion. It used to be called EMF, the electromotive force. That really is a bad name because it's not a force. If it were a force, it'd be measured in newtons, right? So electromotive force though, does give you a bit of an image. It's, you can think of it as being kind of like the force that would cause the electrons to move from zinc to copper, electromotive, okay? If a redox reaction is to be spontaneous, then the cell potential for that reaction has to be positive, right? So cell potentials are positive for redox reactions that are spontaneous, which means what about cell potential and Kc? If a cell potential is positive, the Kc for that reaction is large. When cell potentials are negative, the Kc for that reaction is tiny. So cell potential is related to Kc. And as we'll see later, there's a mathematical connection between them. You can calculate a Kc value if you know the cell potential and reverse as well. Now we have a small problem when it comes to cell potentials. We cannot measure, we have no device which can measure the potential on a single electrode. So we cannot measure zinc's potential. We cannot measure copper's potential. But using a voltmeter, we can measure differences in potential. Okay, if you think about this for a minute. Imagine that we have no way of measuring height, okay? We cannot measure anybody's height, but we can measure differences in height. That's the same idea here. We cannot measure height. We don't have an instrument to measure height, but we can measure differences in height. So suppose Ariel with an L stands up and suppose we say, Ariel with an L, you're gonna be our standard, okay? Ariel, you're our standard, got that? We're gonna, we're gonna give, we're gonna assign a height to you. Because you're our standard, we're gonna say that Ariel's height is zero, okay? Ariel, your height is zero. Then we ask Zenon to stand next to Ariel and we know we can measure the difference. Zenon is, what, two feet taller than Ariel. Well, then, although we can't measure Zenon's height, if we say Ariel's height is zero, then we can now say Zenon's height is two. Now, suppose Dahlia stands up, and we notice Dahlia is half a foot shorter than Ariel. Well, then what would Dahlia's height be? If she's a half a foot shorter than Ariel, what's her height on our scale? Negative, Negative 0.5. Negative 0.5, right? Now, suppose we change our mind and we decide Dahlia is actually going to be our new standard. 
then what would Ariel's new height be? So Dahlia is now going to be zero. What would Ariel become? Positive. Positive point five. What would Zenon become? Positive two point five. That's right. So although we can't measure anybody's heights, we can only measure differences. We can pick whoever we want and we can say, you're the standard, you're gonna be zero. And then we can measure everybody else relative to them. And we can create a table of relative heights. Using that same idea, that same logic, we've decided the hydrogen electrode is our standard electrode. Now, how the hell do you make an electrode using hydrogen? Because it's not a metal, it's a gas. Well, you need a metal surface because the electrons have to flow through the metal. So what you do is you take, if you can see in the picture, you take a, a wire made of platinum okay, and a little plate of platinum. The reason we use platinum is because it's inert. Platinum will not be oxidized or reduced. The platinum will just conduct the electricity. And then you put that wire in the middle of a test tube like contraption but a special test tube. It has an inlet for hydrogen gas coming in and an outlet for, for the excess hydrogen gas to escape. It says one bar. That's, a, that's an unfortunate unit. Um, you can call it one atmosphere if, you, if you're sketching this. One atmosphere would be the standard pressure for hydrogen gas. And then in the beaker, you have a one molar hydrogen ion solution or one molar hydronium solution. And you keep the temperature at 25 degrees Celsius. And what you now have is a standard hydrogen electrode. Standard conditions mean if there are gases like this, they'll be at one atmosphere pressure. Temperature will be 25 degrees. And for anything dissolved in the water, like the hydrogen ions here, they'll be at one molar concentrations. So those are standard conditions. Make sure you know that. One molar concentrations, 25 degrees Celsius, and one atmosphere pressure if gases are involved. So now you take this half cell and you connect it to any other cell, and you not any other half cell and you measure the difference in potential between the two electrodes. Then you give hydrogen's voltage zero volts. You just say it's gonna be zero because it's our standard. And then you assign the voltage you measured to the other electrode. In the same way we just said, Dahlia would be negative 0.5 compared to Ariel. Well, then you might say that copper is negative 0.34 compared to hydrogen. You might say zinc is positive 0.76 compared to hydrogen, okay? Is that making some sense? Yeah. So when we do this and we then measure the, the voltage, you don't have to sketch this next picture, but you can see on the right-hand side there, there's your standard hydrogen electrode. And on the left is the zinc electrode. And so by measuring the difference here, and you can see at the top of voltmeter, 0.76 volts, then if hydrogen is being given a value of zero volts, you take that 0.76 volts and you say zinc is going to have a voltage of 0.76. Okay, now it's a bit of an oversimplification. If you have your data booklets, we're going to wrap up in just a moment. But if you have your data book, let's open them up to the table of reduction potentials. It's on page 10 in your data booklet. It'll look something like this. Okay, make sure you've got this open. At the top of your page in the data booklet, and feel free to write on this if you like. In the, at the top of the page, it says standard reduction potentials. And then it says for one molar solutions, all right, that's standard concentration, 25 degrees Celsius, that's standard temperature. And then it says 101.3 kPa, that's one atmosphere, that's standard pressure. 
So those are standard reduction potentials. On the far right, you can see the symbol E naught, E with a degree symbol. The degree symbol you might want to note for yourself means standard. So if it just said E, that would be a voltage, a potential. But by putting a degree symbol, you're saying standard potential. And then it's measured in volts. That's what the capital V is. Now, look at all the reactions that are in the chart. How do I know these are that this was a reduction potentials chart? Look at the reaction. There are the electrons that are on the left side of every equation, which means they are being gained, aren't they? So these are all half reactions, and they're all gaining electrons, which is reduction. That's why these are reduction potentials. And then where's hydrogen? It's right in the middle, isn't it? Hydrogen ions gain electrons to make hydrogen gas. And what does it say the reduction potential is? Zero. Okay, now find copper. Where's copper two plus gaining electrons? What's its voltage? Talk to me, people. Copper two yeah, plus yeah, positive 0.34 volts. What does that mean? Well, because it's a higher voltage than hydrogen, it just means copper is more likely to be reduced than hydrogen. Copper has a greater potential for reduction. Copper 2 plus is more easily reduced than hydrogen ions. Where's zinc, zinc 2 plus? That's negative 0.76, right? And what does that mean? No, no. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, right. right, negative 0.76, yes. So what does that mean? It means zinc 2 plus is less likely to be reduced than hydrogen. And it's also less likely to be reduced than copper, isn't it? Do you get that? Go back to the battery we talked about earlier. Which electrode was getting reduced? Was it copper or was it, or was it zinc? Where did reduction happen? Uh, the copper was being reduced. Ah, why was copper getting reduced in, in our battery earlier? Because copper ions have a greater reduction potential. And mm. if zinc has a lower reduction potential, then what does that mean about zinc's oxidation potential? It's higher. Higher. Right? Now, are you ready for this amazing thing? What is zinc's reduction potential? negative 0.76 volts, then what would be, read this reaction backwards with me, what would be the oxidation potential for zinc metal? Zinc metal, if I read this backwards, gets oxidized to make zinc 2 plus. So what is zinc metal's oxidation potential? Can you guess? Would it be positive 0.76? Yes, it will be. It'll be positive wow. 0.76 volts. So if you read these reactions in their forward direction, they are reduction reactions, and these are all reduction potentials. But if you read the reactions in reverse, they are oxidation reactions. And then these are become oxidation potentials but you have to change their signs. Make sense? Yes. So where did we get, if you go back to this battery, there's 0.76 volts for zinc. What would happen if I put zinc and copper together? What would be the voltage of that battery? What would be the total voltage of zinc and copper? Let's do this quickly. So jot that down, calculating standard cell potential. There are three simple steps to calculate the standard cell potential. So you're given a battery like this, an electrochemical cell, a voltaic cell, and you said, what's the voltage standard potential for this cell? The first thing is to ask which electrode, copper or zinc, has the higher reduction potential. 
since reduction occurs at the cathode, that's going to be our cathode electrode. Colin, which of these two metals, zinc or copper, which one had the higher reduction potential? Uh, it was the... Wait, you, can, was... you can glance at the table if you forgot. Now I said I said which of the two metals that was actually a badly worded thing. I should have said which which ion copper two plus or zinc two plus. Which one of those has the higher reduction potential? The copper. Yes. So therefore, we now know uh, in this particular cell, copper will be reduced, and therefore zinc would be oxidized. Copper is going to be our cathode and therefore zinc will be our anode. The second thing is to write the half reaction for each of those two reactions. One of them is reduction and one of them is oxidation. So would you do that? Now you don't have to make it up. You can just copy it right off of the chart. So in your notes, write down cathode and then put a colon and write down, just copy it right off the chart, the little half reaction for copper. So copper two plus gains two electrons and makes copper metal. You're just copying that reaction right off of your chart. And beside it, put down its reduction potential. You can give it the symbol E with a degree symbol. That means, that means potential, standard potential and then put a subscript RED, it's a reduction potential. And you'll say the standard reduction potential equals positive 0.34 volts. Then do the same thing for the anode. Am I going too fast here, folks? Yeah, sorry, could you repeat um, how we should write, like after we write the um, cathode? I told you to copy the half reaction yeah, from yeah, the I chart have that. and you write beside it, it's reduction potential from the chart. Okay. And you say E naught reduction, just like you see on the slide, equals 0 0.34 volts. Okay, thank you. Then you do the same thing you just did, but now the anode. Right. But I'm asking, what will be the reaction that you write for the anode? It's not quite as simple as copying it off the chart. Lucas, what do I have to do for the anode reaction? Um, I don't know. Stay with me here. The cathode was a reduction reaction, wasn't it? Okay. Yes? Yeah. And this table we're looking at in our data booklet is full of reduction reactions, which is why I could just copy the copper reaction right off the chart. Okay. But the anode is not reduction. The anode is oxidation. Okay. So, what, so when I find my zinc reaction on this chart, do you see it? Yep. I don't want to write down a reduction reaction. I want to write the oxidation reaction. So what do I write? Instead of just copying that equation, what do I write down? You write it in reverse. Exactly. You okay. write it in reverse. The zinc metal gets oxidized and becomes zinc 2 plus and loses two electrons, doesn't it? Everybody's good with that? You're writing the zinc half reaction in reverse because it's an oxidation reaction. It's at the anode. Then what would its oxidation potential equal? Mac, what will the oxidation potential for zinc equal? Um, would it be um, positive 0 0.76? Yep. On the table, 
it says negative 0.76, but that's its reduction potential. We said earlier, you just change the sign if you're reading it backwards. So now it's positive 0.76 volts. The last thing to do, the third step, is combine your two half reactions and just add the two potentials together. The cell potential is the sum of the reduction in the oxidation potentials. So take those two half reactions, just like we did in our balancing reactions by half reaction method, and recombine them. One of them was gaining two electrons, the other was losing two electrons, so you don't need to multiply by anything. Your overall reaction should say zinc metal reacts with copper two plus and becomes copper metal and zinc two plus. And then you would say the cell potential is equal to 0 0.34 plus 0 0.76, which gives you a cell potential of 1.10 volts. So that's what your answer should look like. All right, folks, we're going to stop there today. That was a lot to squeeze into one class, but hopefully you have a little sense of what an electrochemical cell is. You understand vocabulary. If you want to read this over tonight, the anode, the cathode, the salt bridge, the direction electrons travel, you're going to have to sketch these things and label them. You understand what the voltage is, what the cell potential is, hopefully, how to use that chart to get the cell potential for a reaction. Okay, we're going to practice this again tomorrow in class. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for sticking through. Enjoy your, your day. We will see you guys tomorrow, okay?